Hey guys, it's Stephen from TopTipBio.com. In this video, I'm going to explain what a Pearson correlation test is and the assumptions behind it. And just a note that I will not be covering the detailed maths involved within the test, but instead provide a gentle introduction to the test itself. Another thing I'd like to say before I start is that the majority of people who watch my videos are not actually subscribed to my channel. In fact, only 1.7% of those who are subscribed actually watch my content consistently. So if you do find this content useful, please consider subscribing. It really does help support the channel. Without further ado, let's begin the video. So suppose I've measured two continuous variables, weight and height, in 10 different people. If I plot the data on a scatter graph so that the weight data is on the x-axis and the height data is on the y-axis, it will look something like this. Each point on the graph represents a single person's paired measurement of weight and height. So, for example, this point indicates the data from participant 1, who had a weight of 66 kilograms and a height of 115 centimeters. And this point here indicates the data from participant 9, who had a weight of 70.7 kilograms and a height of 140.6 centimeters. Note that for the purpose of a Pearson correlation test, it does not matter which variable is plotted on the x-axis and which is plotted on the y-axis. And also, the two variables do not need to be measured using the same scale. As you can see in this example, I have weight measured in kilograms and height measured in centimeters. So you can clearly see that the values of weight vary between different participants. Similarly, the values for height also vary between different participants. And as shown in this graph, the two variables tend to vary together. That is, as the value of weight increases, so does the value for height. And they seem to do so in a linear fashion. If I plot a line of best fit through this data, you can see this relationship easier. And this relationship between variables and statistics is known as covariation, or more simply, correlation. A Pearson correlation test is used to measure the strength and direction of this linear covariation. So suppose I have performed a Pearson correlation test using my example data. I get three outputs in return. I get what is known as an R value, an R squared value, and a P value. Let's put the R squared and the p-value aside for a moment and concentrate on this R value. So what is R? R refers to the Pearson correlation coefficient. And just a note here that R is usually written in lowercase in the literature, not uppercase R. So this single value can tell us two things. It can tell us the direction of the correlation, and it can also tell us the strength of the correlation. So in this example, the correlation coefficient is 0.9557. But what does this actually mean? It's worth mentioning that the correlation coefficient value can be any number between negative one and positive one, and it has no units of measure. To understand the direction of the linear correlation, you simply look at whether the coefficient value is negative or positive. A positive R value indicates a positive correlation between the two variables. And this can be seen in our example, since our R value is a positive number. If we performed a different experiment measuring different variables and plotted our data and it looked like this, then we performed a Pearson correlation test, we might get a different R value, say negative 0.82. Since the R value is negative, this means that there is a negative correlation between the two variables. So as variable X increases, variable Y decreases or vice versa if this was plotted the other way around. Next, let's talk about understanding the strength of the correlation by looking at R. The absolute value of R indicates how strong the two variables correlate in a linear fashion. To put the magnitude of this correlation into perspective, I'll reuse our example of determining the correlation of weight and height. An R value of plus one indicates a perfectly positive association between the two variables height and weight. So if we drew a line of best fit through this data, the line would pass through the center of all points perfectly. It's worth mentioning that the same correlation coefficient value 
can look differently when plotted on a scatter graph. For example, this data set also has a correlation coefficient value of plus 1, which is the same correlation coefficient value as before. So don't confuse the correlation coefficient with the slope of the line of best fit. Next, here is the relationship between two other variables that has a correlation coefficient value of negative 1. This indicates a perfectly negative association between variables x and y. Similarly, if I drew a line of best fit, see how this passes through all points perfectly. And a value of 0 indicates no correlation at all between the variables x and y. There have been some attempts to apply cutoffs to the absolute correlation coefficient value to describe the magnitude of correlation between two variables. However, these are very broad cutoffs that do not take into account the scientific question. It is very important to interpret a correlation coefficient value in the context of the experiment in question. For example, an R value of 0.2 may indicate a weak correlation in some scientific disciplines, but it actually might be a rather large correlation in other areas of science. Let's now go back to our example. Remember when I shown you the three main outputs from the Pearson correlation test? Well, let's now move our focus onto R squared. R squared refers to the coefficient of determination. It is an absolute value between 0 and 1. As the name suggests, R squared is computed by squaring the R value. In other words, multiplying R by R. So if you don't have an R squared value from your Pearson correlation test, you can simply square the R value. In this example, my R squared is 0 0.9133. To interpret this value better, it is more informative to multiply it by 100 to convert it to a percentage. So the R squared of 0 0.9133 equals 91.33%. This particular value indicates the amount of variation shared between the two variables. So here we can say that 91.33% of the variability in weight is explained by the variability in height. And since it does not matter which way around the variables go on the axes, this means that the reverse is also true. 91.33% of the variability in height is explained by the variability in weight. This means that the other 8.67% of the variance is explained by other factors that were not measured in the experiment. For example, measurement errors. Now, the third main output from Pearson correlation test is obviously the p-value. Usually, when performing the test, a two-tailed analysis is performed. In this case, the null hypothesis is there is no correlation between weight and height in the overall population. In other words, the correlation coefficient value is equal to zero. And the alternative hypothesis is that there is a correlation between weight and height in the overall population. So in this case, the correlation coefficient does not equal zero. In my example, the p-value is so small that it is quoted as less than 0.0001. Therefore, if my alpha level, in other words, my significance threshold, was set at 0 0.05, we then reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a correlation between weight and height. Note, we did not state the direction, either positive or negative, of the correlation in our hypotheses. If we did state a direction in the hypotheses, this would mean a one-tailed test is performed. So now you know what a Pearson correlation test is, Let's now move on to discussing what the assumptions are of the test. To be able to perform a Pearson correlation test and interpret the results, the data must satisfy all of the following assumptions. If one assumption is not met, then you cannot perform a Pearson correlation test and interpret the results correctly. But it may be possible to perform a different correlation test. So the first assumption is that your sample is random. The sample that is used for your experiment should contain a truly random sample that is representative of one population of interest. So how do you test this? Of course, this is determined by your experimental setup. For example, when recruiting participants, 
in your study, were the participants randomly recruited? If so, then you're good to go with this assumption. The second assumption is that both variables are continuous data. Both variable x and variable y involved in the test should be measured on a continuous scale, i.e. on an interval or ratio level. So how do you test this? So you can decide this by simply looking at your two variables of interest. Examples of interval measurements include temperature and pH. Examples of ratio measurements include weight and height that was used within this example. If your data is on a continuous scale, then you're good to go with this assumption. If your data isn't measured on a continuous scale, for example, if it is ordinal data, such as disease severity or performance grouping, then you may want to look at an alternative correlation method, such as a Spearman correlation test. The third assumption is that the data contains paired samples. To perform the test, each subject must have both variable x and variable y values. To test this, you can simply look and just visually inspect your data. Obviously, this depends how large your data set is. Or, you can run some simple descriptive statistics about your data. If there are missing data, where a few participants did not have data from one variable, then these entries are usually removed by the statistical program before the Pearson correlation test is performed. So don't worry too much if you have missing values, but remember that your total n number within the analyses will be reduced. The fourth assumption is that there is independence of observations. So there should be no relationship between the values of variables between subjects. Each observation of the x variable should be independent of other observations of x and each observation of the y variable should be independent of other observations of y. You can largely test this by looking at your experimental setup. For example, are any of the subjects recruited in the study related? If so, this would violate the independence of observations assumption. The fifth assumption is that the variables are approximately sampled from a normal or Gaussian distribution. So both x and y variables must be sampled from a population that exhibits an approximate normal distribution. Testing your data for normality has been discussed in a lot more detail previously, but the two main methods to check this are to inspect your data on visual plots such as QQ plots and frequency distributions, and to perform normality statistical tests. If one or both of your variables are not sampled from a normal distribution, then the Pearson correlation p-value cannot be correctly interpreted. If this assumption is violated, then you can try transforming your data to improve the distribution. Or, you may want to perform correlation tests that do not assume normality of data, for example, a Spearman correlation test. The next assumption is that a linear association exists between the variables. So this may seem counterintuitive, but this assumption is often overlooked when performing a Pearson correlation test. That is, the two variables must exhibit a linear correlation before you actually run the test. Remember, the aim of the Pearson correlation test is to measure the magnitude of the linear correlation between two variables. The best and most simple way to test this is to plot the two variables on a scatter plot and visually inspect it. If no linear association exists, then do not perform a Pearson correlation test. Pure and simple. When inspecting this scatter plot, a nonlinear relationship could exist. If so, you can measure the magnitude of a nonlinear monotonic relationship with a Spearman correlation test. And the final assumption covered here is that there should be no outliers present in your data. As with the previous assumption, the best way to test for outliers is to plot a scatter plot. Outliers can heavily influence a Pearson correlation test. For example, if I remove this outlier, notice how the association improves. If you have outliers in your data, you will need to think carefully about your next steps. Either remove the outliers with justification, or run a correlation test that is less sensitive to outliers, such as a Spearman correlation test. So, to sum up, 
A Pearson correlation test measures the direction and how strong a linear covariation is between two variables. The result is a single value known as the Pearson correlation coefficient, or R value. A positive R value indicates that as one variable increases, so does the other. A negative R value indicates that as one variable increases, the other decreases. If you square the R value, you get the coefficient of determination, or simply R squared. This R squared value indicates the amount of variance shared between the two variables. A p-value from the Pearson correlation test is used in hypothesis testing to determine if the correlation between the two variables is statistically significant. There are many assumptions of a Pearson correlation test. All of these need to be satisfied before you perform the test. And these are, the sample is random, both variables are continuous data, data contains paired samples, there is independence of observations, the variables are approximately normally distributed, a linear association exists between the two variables, and finally, there are no outliers in your data. Did you like this video? Be sure to give it a like or leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to be notified when a new video is added.